Good morning, everyone. It's another very early morning for me. On June 15th, 2016, here on Kauai, still dark outside, so no little birdies chirping this time. I wanted to share with you a story, and it's something that really happened to me, but it has to do with a really mysterious and wonderful location. I don't know if any of you have heard of it before, but it's called the Dream Mine, and it is in Utah, near Spanish Fork. Now, in the 1970s, I lived in Salt Lake City, which is not far from Spanish Fork, and my mother and I and a friend of mine had heard about the Dream Mine. Now, understand that I was living in Salt Lake City because I was basically requested to go there and to live there four different times, in fact, in a very short period of time by my, my um, inner planes guides. And this was before Thoth. Now, this was my inner planes, these were my inner planes guides who were bringing me along and, you know, instructing me, teaching me, helping me uh, in the initial part of my journey. And they told me that I did indeed have a mentor, an interplanes benefactor, as they called him. But Thoth wouldn't appear to me into my conscious mind until 1977. And this was earlier than that, probably 74, 75 in there sometime. And so, they, these beings, uh, the ones that worked with me, they, they were not illuminaries. They were, um, they went or flew around in spaceships, <laughs> but they looked perfectly human, and their spaceships were of a very high order Merkaba, but they were more, you know, in that area of beingness rather than high illuminary ones. So when we lived in Salt Lake City, both my mother and I, well, I was called to, to come out to certain locations, and they would uh, show me their ships. Now, I think they were doing this to help build my morale, my feeling of confidence that this was really happening. Of course, my mother and I had, had a lot of experiences, them appearing in our bedrooms, both of us, together and separately. And... When they called me to come out and watch the ships, my mother came with me. We saw them together. And in fact, a friend of mine uh, would come as well at times. So on this occasion, there was actually a big to-do in the paper and everything that, you know, these wacko New Agers were going to go out to dream mine and sit around and watch, wait for the spaceships to come in. Now, I'm going to pause my story because you need to know more about Dream Mind first. So that takes us over to this page. I managed to find this on the web. To, if I can read it, it's such small print. Okay, this, you know, this has to do with the Latter-day Saints, you know, the church there and all of that. Bishop Coyle's spiritual gifts. Similar to the story of Jesse Knight, John Coyle became involved in mining because of his gift of dreams. His dream mine is, a, is very different from nearly every other mine, not only in its inception and operation. <coughs> ah, sorry. Oops. sorry about that. I had to stop for a coughing spell. <laughs> okay, let's start that over. Um... Anyway, the dream mine is very different from nearly every other mine, not only in its inception and operation, but especially in its final destiny and purpose. The story of this mine, located in the hills above Salem, Utah, well, I said Spanish Fork, but actually that is where Spanish Fork is, really be begins shortly after his marriage to Emily Holt in 1884. The young couple purchased a small farm in Salem air in the Salem area and started to raise a few cattle. The loss of one of their heifers 
was a rather serious economic setback for the family, so after several days of unsuccessfully searching for the animal, John asked the Lord in prayer to help him find it. The answer came in a very unusual dream, showing his cow down by a railroad trestle with her eye. Oops, one horn had been knocked down and was interfering with her eye. The next morning, John told his wife that he knew where the cow was, and he set off to get it. Being very familiar with the area, he went directly to the location shown in the dream and found the cow exactly as he had seen her. As he was leading the injured animal back home, he thanked the Lord for this unusual answer to his prayer and told him that if he could be blessed with that spiritual gift, he would use it in serving him all his life. Three years passed, and John received a call to go to a mission for the church. One of his final significant missionary experiences in the southern states was a warning dream about a threatening mob. Once again, the gift of dreams came to his rescue, and by following instructions in his dream, he avoided a serious conflict with the mob. On another occasion, he dreamed that a mob would form a at a missionary conference, but this time it was the mission president who would be in the dream, so he did not attend the conference. As shown in Coyle's dream, a mob interrupted the meeting, and the leader demanded to know where the long, lanky, red-headed elder was. Upon learning he was not there, the mob departed without further trouble. Okay, so when the John Golden heard of this incident, he said to Elder Coyle, if you ever have any more of these dreams, be sure to let me know. Because of this and other experiences, John H. Coyle and J. Golden Kimball remained lifelong friends. Okay, here we go to the meat of the subject. Although his mission for the LDS Church came to an end, Coyle's spiritual gifts did not. He resumed his business as a farmer, and one night in August of 1894, John had a most unusual experience. A heavenly messenger appeared to him with, inst with, with instructions that he had been chosen to perform a very special work for the Lord. He was reminded of the ancient Nephite civilization that had once flourished on the continent how they rose to great power and wealth, but eventually became wicked, corrupt, and were finally destroyed. He was told that this present generation was about to take a similar course. However, this time some of the people would be spared. Now, I'm going to interrupt for just a moment to say this is all part of the, you know, the prophecy of, um, um, Oh my goodness, I lived there all these years and I can't think of it. Not Brigham Young, but the other fellow that actually had the vision and everything. Anyway, that these ancient Nephite civilization, which obviously a lot of ancient civilizations have been found, you know, traces on our continent. We know that in, the, in America and many other continents, including Egyptian and, and all sorts of beings. So this is what they talk about when they say Nephite. It was eventually probably one of these ancient cultures. So to continue with the article, <clears throat> the messenger took John to a mountain just east of Salem and showed him a rich Nephite gold mine. He was instructed that he was to drill tunnels in that mountain in order to reach the gold that, and that he would be directed by dreams to do this work, which would require many years and much money. He was told not to enter into the mountain through the old existing Nephite tunnel located on the south side of the mountain, but rather to blast new tunnels. One was to run nearly a mile horizontally into the mountain and then be drilled down through a three-foot capstone into nine large rooms once mined by the Nephites. The ore at this place would be so rich that there seemed to be more gold than rock. Now, that is the part that I have uh, found on the web about it. <clears throat> I, it doesn't really go any further. I was hoping that it would. 
Let me see. Okay, here's a little more. There's not a whole lot of it out there. There's not even a wiki on it, which I'm surprised. Anyway, uh, good old John in his uh, cave, a mine, he had problems um, because a lot of people didn't believe him and, you know, he had gotten in a lot of trouble with it all. So um, this is what it's saying in, in the... He went to a meeting to try to get people to, behind him to back this effort because, of course, it would cost money. Um, and he realized that by putting his name on this document, he had broken the promise he had made by not writing anything concerning the mine. He promised the angel, so to speak. Uh, he, so, unfortunately, he died a broken man. That's not a happy ending, is it? Um, however, uh, people have bought shares in this mine a long ago, and this person that's writing this is my own family had bought some of these shares. In fact, the tale goes that Grandpappy Waffles, Waffles <laughs> was rewarded for his loyalty with a glimpse of that the treasure and was permitted to take a portion of it. Uh, there are many legends that I heard of when I was there. People talked that, you know, some people did get treasures out of this mine. And it wasn't a, a failed effort by any means. But uh, they kept it secret. So that's the story there. Well, I'm not sure what happened, but I accidentally paused it, and I was just talking away. So I'm just going to get to my story about Dream Mine. I'm not sure where I left off, but I'm pretty sure I didn't tell my story yet. As I might have or might not have said, the man that had the dream, the vision, he died in poverty. But um, there are people who claim they did get gold out of that mine, and it was all kept very secret. I don't know if that's true or not. There's a whole story about why he didn't achieve what he was going to. He kind of broke his promise to these beings that appeared to him. He didn't do it intentionally so much so, but it did happen that way, and that's where everything went downhill for him. <clears throat> so... At that, this point, I'm just going to tell my story again because I just finished telling it, but the microphone was turned off. So my mother and my friend and I had gone, had heard about the dream mine, and we'd gone up to the area. And the area is this area near Spanish Fork, and if you go up to the actual mine. Here it is, the opening to it. Maybe I can find a better picture. I had all this on my screen before, you know, and it just, uh, so I don't know if I'm repeating myself or what, but anyway, there's what it looks like. And we went into this area. There's a guard there. And you can see the beginnings of the mine and where it leads down. But there was hardly anybody there. It's not like a lot of people go up there. So you can see another picture of it here. And <clears throat> so we went to this gathering that had been advertised in the paper. They had said, I'm trying to find another picture, but can't. Oh, this is more or less the area. It was down below here that we were gathered. They had said that there were these people that were calling in spaceships. And if came at this time and place, they would call in some spaceships. Well, you know, I mean, we didn't know if this was for real or not, but we thought, what the heck, we'll just go. And we did. And um, there was about 40 people there, most of them young people. Some of them... Uh, on pot and whatever, and they were happy. Maybe some of them were drinking, I don't know, but they were like making noise and whatever. And uh, But at the appointed time, we went around six o'clock and by about eight o'clock, they started calling the ships in. And everybody got quiet for a while. 
And uh, we all focused on asking these beings to appear. And lo and behold, about 20 minutes, 30 minutes into all of this, we were. it was a bright sky, you know, I mean, a clear sky, night, stars out. And um, we started seeing these dots of light appear and moving closer to us. Not just one dot, several dots of light. And they were definitely moving closer to us. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, this is in the days of cell phone cameras and stuff. So nobody, I, I didn't, we didn't have any cameras. And even if we had, the old 70s cameras wouldn't have captured this unless they'd been, you know, with a lens and everything. So I don't have any pictures. But we were definitely seeing this. You know, it was moving toward us. And just as they got really close, I would say close, some people in the crowd started screaming and yelling and bagging on things and laughing hysterically and uh, all kinds of stuff. And the minute that started, I mean, just the lights went off. Boom. They didn't move away. They just, bam, went off. Like just turning, you know, unplugging a switch. And that was it. They didn't come back. Now, when we were at the Dream Mine, we did talk to the old guardian that was up there. They had guards 24-7 up there at the time. I don't know if they do now. You know, like, what are they guarding if there isn't something there? And, um, but this old guy, you know, he had his shift up there. And we sat down one-on-one on, one on one and talked with him. And he said that he had seen the angel, a uh, tall, blonde figure in a white robe, would be seen walking around up there. He had seen it. Some of the other guards had seen it. You know, and he was very believable, this man was. He was a perfectly normal person. And he just, you know, told us what he saw. So I would say that there is a mine there. You know, the... Um, it might have been the Anunnaki. I don't know who these beings were, but, you know, because he's seeing a guardian of, like this, that's a spiritual being. Uh, the Anunnaki, well, some of them were and some of them weren't, but they had a lot of gold mines going, if you'll recall, in, the, in Samaria and uh, in Africa uh, that um, people talk about. So I'm not sure exactly, but I do know the energy of the whole place was very spiritual. So I can only tell you my experience and what was seen there. So I hope you enjoyed my story, and thank you for listening. <laughs>